welcome to Hannah's heart. So Hannah, she's just one of the women who did struggle with infertility in the Bible. No matter who we are, we can be inspired by the fact that Hannah took her pain to God and God heard her and was with her. So when she was praying at the temple, she had been weeping and not eating and her lips were moving, but her eyes were closed and the priest was like, hey, why are you drunk at the temple? Because <laughs> yeah. it can become an obsession when you want Wanting a child so deeply. And desiring that baby and to be a mama. Every holiday, every Mother's Day. This is not a show that's going to promise you a certain outcome. Mm-hmm. But this is a show that says, however God answers your cry, we know that he's enough. Hey, this is Kendra. And I'm Ann, and thank you all for listening to Hannah's Heart again. Uh, We're happy to be here and happy that you are here. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, and you can also find us on the AFA streaming platform now, so I hope that you go give that a listen or a watch. You can also email us at uh, Hannah's Heart first, so Hannah's Heart at AFA.net, and we've been getting show suggestions and and prayer request Mm -hmm. there as well. And so we really appreciate you taking the time to email us, even when when you're letting us know you disagree with us. (laughs) I really really still appreciate Mm -hmm. um, getting those emails. So Mm -hmm. keep them coming. Yeah. So for those of you that this is your first time listening, this is a show that deals with infertility and miscarriage um, and planning and building your family in unexpected ways. And one of those ways often is um, adoption. It's not for everybody. Um, But today's topic, we are talking about those who are called to adopt special needs children. Um, And um, if you haven't already listened, we had on last week a very special guest, my father, Dave White, who is a licensed clinical social worker for over 35 years um, and also um, has some personal experience. Um, so just to kind of recap, for those of you that weren't there um, to hear that episode, he, uh, we have, um, I have three brothers that were adopted um, and one biological brother um, and all that dealt with uh, different areas of special needs. And um, dad, first of all, welcome to the show. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Could you give us real quick, you mentioned last week, um, the five different categories that qualify as a special needs adoption. Just kind of review that for us. Sure. And and just again, remember that um, different states have different qualifications. Mm-hmm. So I know AFA goes over the whole nation. And so uh, keep that in mind. In general, uh, what qualifies as a special needs child is number one, any type of physical issues. Um, issues such as failure to thrive, autism, uh, uh, children that have been burned, uh, feeding uh, to wheelchair children, uh, issues that are going to be long lasting, uh, issues that are are not going to be solved quickly, uh, but that are outside of the normal, ordinary uh, dealings what a parent would deal with. Next would be mental health or mental retardation issues. Um, Again, a lot of these kids are uh, very much trauma victims. Uh, They've gone through a lot of abuse, uh, neglect, physical, sexual abuse, emotional abuse. And so uh, they're dealing with a lot of of, uh, attachment disorders. They're dealing with depression, anxiety, issues that uh, not necessarily a a child in a a normal Christian home would uh, be faced with on a daily basis. Third are emotional and behavioral um, issues. Um, Again, a lot of this uh, goes back to the trauma that they experienced as young children, Uh, the trauma that continues with them uh, the rest of their lives because uh, they've missed some of that uh, uh, early developmental stability that they did not have in in a normal um, loving home. Uh, so you're going to be issues like with lying and stealing and um, uh, sexual perversion or or drugs and alcohol, uh, failing in school, hoarding food, running away, fighting, all of that type of stuff that, uh, again, is not necessarily something every other home experiences. Uh, another uh, issue that uh, could qualify someone as a special needs child is uh, sibling groups, groups of two, three, four, or even more um, children uh, that the state wants to try to keep together for obvious reasons because they're bonded. They've gone through this trauma, uh, been taken away from their biological tr- uh, parents, mm-hmm. and the state tries to keep them together as much as possible uh, for the stability. And the last is um, age. 
Uh, a lot of these children are um, older kids. They're teenagers, uh, 13, 14, right on up to 17 years age. Uh, they're harder to place because everybody wants a healthy infant uh, or a healthy two-year-old or a healthy three-year-old, but not necessarily a healthy 16 or 17-year-old that also has behavioral problems and, and is failing to uh, do well in school and is, is used marijuana or, you know, goes on and on and on. So a lot of these kids have multiple issues. They're not just uh, one category, but they're multiple categories. So as you're talking about this, I had this funny picture that came into my mind. In a lot of people's houses, they have that sign that says, live, laugh, love, mm -hmm. right? And I just picture all the typical family portraits of a nice family on the beach and everything's going well. Um, but for many people that are called to special needs adoption, they have to rewire in their mind what the picture of their family looks like as these problems of dealing with past trauma in children arises. Let's talk about that. I want both of you, Anne, because you said you've fostered some some children in the past that mm -hmm. have struggled with, with trauma as well. Let's say a, a couple has gotten into fostering and all of a sudden they are confronted with, wow, I just thought it was going to be, yes, ma'am, thank you for um, rescuing me <laughs> and helping me. Um, and that's not always the response. That's typically not the response of children that have been taken out of their homes. Um, how can you prepare parents to deal with that? Well, there is um, a lot of special needs training that these parents do yeah. go through that hopefully will provide them with at least some basic understanding. Mm -hmm. Now, to become any type of adoptive uh, parent, you have to go through, you know, physical exams and they look at your bank account and they, you know, interview people in your, in your family and they look at how you were raised as a child and, and so many other things. But I when say they get to know you better than your parents know you. <laughs> they, they sometimes do. Yeah, yeah. really. The yeah. stuff we had to put on our interview, I was like, literally no one else on the planet knows this stuff. So, <laughs> But with special needs children, it even goes a step further yeah. because they're getting training in special needs. And sometimes if they have a particular child that they want to adopt that let's say is in a wheelchair mm -hmm. that has physical problems, then they're going to get a lot of special training mm -hmm. on how to deal with a child that is probably not going to walk, yeah. you know, the rest of their lives and how to prepare that child for that and how to prepare their house mm -hmm. uh, to, to have a child that's in a wheelchair. Right, right. Uh, and you can put, at least in Mississippi, you can put on your application yes or no for special needs children because of that reason like if your house literally isn't feasible for a wheelchair different things like that is that how it is it's not Kentucky? everybody's called so right that right that's a that. that's a huge undertaking as well as also getting into just foster care mm. yeah. adoption is 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 lifelong yeah yeah foster care is not necessarily the goal of foster care is is almost always initially anyway mm -hmm. to return to the care of their parents right and once a child is open for adoption whether it's regular adoption or special needs adoption that uh, termination of parental, parental rights has already uh, happened yeah. so it's as if that parent that biological parent were no longer their parent gotcha. anymore. Gotcha. Is that how it was for both of the adoptions for uh, y'all? Yes, all, okay. all three of our boys were were already terminated. Okay. Right now, now the first two were we were still foster parents, and so they were terminated. Uh, rights were terminated with their biological parents while they were still in foster care with us. Gotcha. And then once they uh, uh, rights had been terminated, then we could start the process to adoption. But we actually did not go into um, that. Uh, with the idea of adopting, yeah, we we thought we were just going to be foster parents, <laughs> and yeah. uh, but when that bond was already there, there was no way that we could say at the end of it, oh no, we right. can't keep these two. Mm -hmm. uh, we already loved them; they were already our boys; they were our sons, and uh, um, you know it's very different because even um, families, uh, extended families, don't always understand mm -hmm. when you adopt um, special needs children. Mm -hmm. My parents, um, who uh, were both older at the time, uh, my mom said, I don't know, I can't promise you that I'm going to love them exactly the mm -hmm. same um, because I've never uh, had any adoption in our families. She I was didn't... trying to be probably honest. She's trying to be honest. And she said, you know, back in her days, um, children, you know, that had mm -hmm. been abused and neglected were put in institutions yeah. and you just didn't see them again. Mm. And mm. that's, of course, not the case nowadays right. by any means. 
Um, a lot of the, the large child care institutions are no longer existing where they've changed their focus yeah. to more treatment oriented, short term treatment oriented. Uh, but children are by and large in foster care uh, till they can be legally adopted. Well, to your point, we've had some guests on the show that have been parents of adopted children that have said that they struggled wondering, am I going to be able to love these children as if they are my own. And I think typically across the board, what we have discovered is that um, sometimes the love might look differently, but God is able to pour an exceedingly abundantly more love than you could have ever imagined Absolutely. when it's a calling. Right. Well, that's one thing I wanted to say too. It This sounds like incredibly hard, like almost like undoable hard. And then, yeah, for me to think about like, okay, I, I know what foster care is like, but then to add on special needs here. But what I hope that we're getting across, too, is that these children need families. Mm-hmm. You know, like just because of this special need doesn't mean that it's not worth the hard mm-hmm. work. I think the most important thing to remember, you know, when I'm saying all of this is that these are still children. Yeah. These yeah. are human beings who deserve our love and respect, and they're children that deserve homes that are mm. going to be lasting. Mm-hmm. Now, are you going to be dealing with things that you normally would not ever have to think about dealing? Absolutely. Right, right. Let me uh, tell you a quick funny kind of funny story now. When we looked, when it actually happened, it wasn't funny. Uh, once one of our, our boys uh, was mad at us, and uh, so he called in a fake child abuse report. Oh, man. So we had social services come out to our home and interview us about uh, uh, this fake issue. So we're sitting at the kitchen table with the social worker there. And do you remember this? <laughs> I do. <laughs> so uh, we were, my father-in-law was there at the time and he was, he's a, an electrician and he was up in our attic and was um, laying floorboard and uh, putting in um, electricity so we could have lighting in our, our, our attic. You took one of the older boys up there. One of the, the one of the one of the older boys, our oldest son, was up there with him and the, the thought was he was going to learn uh, some electrical issues, some trade issues from from his grandpa. And uh, so, you know, they're tromping around the attic as we're um, you know, being interviewed by this <laughs> the, the social worker. And my son, who bless his heart, love him to death. <laughs> But long story short, he put his foot through the ceiling and came partially down <laughs> through the ceiling. Dangling feet. Feet dangling. Right behind the social worker who was interviewing <laughs> us for a fake child abuse charge. Oh, and Lord. some of the dust and you know particles from the ceiling <laughs> falls on this poor social worker guy. And, you know, my... I didn't know what do you say at something like that. You, you know, I just kind of threw my hands up and said, and that's not child abuse either. <laughs> Fortunately, he laughed and he, you know, he thought it was uh, was hilarious. But but the whole thought is you deal with things that you don't normally yeah. uh, expect to have to deal with. Right. So, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I was going to say even, so we have now adopted our little boy through foster care and but we picked him up from the hospital when he was two days old but I still feel like I've even talked to some friends here because he is not the same race as us and then his family biological family does live nearby and so I personally feel like we need to gear up because his he's gonna have difficulties with different races him being Mm -hmm. raised in a different race and so I want people to know too like there, even if you do get that infant baby that you wanted to be able to adopt, you still need to be prepared for different challenges mm-hmm. for that baby, a growing up little boy, little girl, to and the have different. Of where did I come from? Right, and yeah. like helping them to find that deep-seated need. Would you talk a little bit about how you addressed with all of the boys their biological families and yeah. um, the openness for like meeting siblings and how you dealt with that? Sure, sure. Um, our, our our first two boys were seven and eight when we uh, first got them in foster care, and I think they were eight and nine when we actually uh, uh, adopted them legally. Uh, their biological father was was deceased. Their biological mother um, actually also died within t- probably two years of us mm. um, adopting them. Um, she had had uh, unbelievably ten children, five that had been removed from her care mm. and uh, rights terminated in Indiana, and five in Kentucky. 
Um, our boys were the sixth and seventh out of 10 children uh, that she'd had rights terminated. Uh, so there was no point in seeing any of her, uh, uh, the parents, the biological parents. They did have two brothers um, that they knew that they, you know, they were again seven and eight when, when uh, they came to live with us. And uh, their brothers uh, lived in uh, a town right next to us. Mm-hmm. And we actually encouraged them to have contact with them. By no means at all did we want to say, oh, just forget all about your past. You know, you right. don't need to do that. You're our family now. That that would be very foolish to do. That that was very much a part of her path. So we encouraged them. We uh, and took for them many over. children, it's dependent upon what they their heart and desire is. Some exactly. don't want contact. Some do. Exactly, and they wanted contact, and so we always uh, you know accepted and encouraged that. And uh, as the years went by, they they had less and less, mm-hmm. uh, but it was always their choice. Now our third adopted child. Uh, uh, had some biological brothers, but um, he really did not want to ever see them. Uh, again, because I worked in the system, I actually met two of them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, well, it's been years and years ago, took pictures of them <laughs> so that he, he could see them later on if he ever wanted to. Yeah. But uh, And his biological mother, as far as we still know, um, is alive. We don't know who his biological father is. She had, was sleeping around apparently with a number of men, but uh, the uh, mother is still alive. But again, he basically said, I don't want to have any contact with her. Mm. Um, You're my dad. You're my mom. Uh, I don't want any contact with her at all. Um, She gave me up for adoption. And uh, he knows that that is uh, perfectly okay with us. And, but if he ever wants contact, we would be glad to, to help him with that. Now for all three of the boys, I made them something called a life book. Uh, because, um, again, I was in the system, I had a lot more information, mm, uh, mm-hmm. pictures and, and uh, psychological exams and, and uh, police reports and you name it, you know, that, that another uh, ordinary adoptive parent would not necessarily have to access to. And so I made them a book that's called a life book that explained their past. Wow. And, that's uh, so neat for you to take the time to do that because I have a feeling just how important I know that would be mm-hmm. important to me. And uh, yeah, they treasure those. Um, yeah. They 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 treasure those because that's a lot of the only pictures and information they had from their uh, first years, early years. Well, and to have the confidence as a parent, because you're when you adopt, I would assume you're wanting this child to connect and um, attach to you, so there could be a little bit of fear maybe in dealing with the biological family. Mm-hmm. But to be able to overcome your fears and say what's best for this child and their needs and the questions that they're going to have. And the other thing is we took a lot, a lot, a lot of pictures uh, of them when they were in our family. Mm. And so, yes, while they have these life books, they also have a number of photo albums mm-hmm. of of things with us. Yeah. Scout yeah. trips and soccer games mm-hmm. and family vacations and camping trips and cook out at grandma and grandpa's house and uh, you know, all the normal, uh, normal events, Christmas day and, and, uh, you know, Thanksgiving meals and all of that. We, they have, all of that is very well photographed mm-hmm. and for them, uh, to have, to prove that they are a part of our family. Mm-hmm. All right. We've got to jump into a topic that I know some people listening are like, please help me. Let's say you're called to special needs adoption and you are drowning in being overwhelmed with these needs. Maybe you're struggling with personal anger, you're exhausted and you're just like, I need a day away. Um, What kind of care do parents need to give to each other and and themselves? Well, that day away thing is big. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Some states will offer respite care for um, adoptive, special needs adoptive parents, Mm -hmm. where uh, someone, they'll, they'll actually pay for someone to come into your home and stay or take the child out of your home and uh, stay for a couple hours or maybe an overnight or maybe even a weekend uh, to give those adoptive parents a respite from uh, the emotional uh, difficulties in in having an an adoptive child, special needs adoptive child. Um, They also will offer subsidies um, in some states. uh, If your child has a lot of medical needs or you know, that, that ne- your basic income would not necessarily be able to provide. There are subsidies for those children uh, to help pay for that. So they'll give you a monthly check uh, to to help subsidize the, the needs of that child. 
A lot of children are also uh, open for Medicaid, mm -hmm. which will uh, pay for their counseling, and they should be in counseling if at all possible um, to, to deal with a lot of these issues, and there needs to be a close relationship between that counselor and the adoptive parents. Um, now, sometimes even the perfect setup where, you, like, let's say you, you're a social worker, mom's a teacher, and you have a child who has more needs than you can even give them. You, you know what I'm talking about. Will you talk about that? <laughs> One of our boys um, had been with us for eight years. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a master's level social worker. I have my, my license in Kentucky, a licensed clinical social worker. I've been in counseling for 35 years. Uh, my wife is a, a school teacher. She has worked for um, uh, runaway shelters for special needs uh, residential uh, homes. So we had a vast amount of experience, but we had one of our boys whose behavior um, at home became to the point where it was more than we could handle. Mm. And it what got to the point where he was it was actually harmful to um, some of our, our younger children. Mm. And so we had to make a very extreme and difficult situation to temporarily place him out of the home into a treatment facility. And the the worker who helped us with that, uh, God bless him, he was a Christian man, same one that the, the <laughs> that ceiling <laughs> fell in on. But you know, what he said to me once was, you were trying to do the job of a treatment plant home, mm. but you didn't have enough staff. Mm. And that really blessed me a lot because it wasn't a, I'm a failure because I'm having to temporarily place my child back into state's care to get more need than, than we can provide. Yeah. It was simply a matter of this child needs more than a normal uh, loving home can provide. Yeah. Even if he had been the only person in the home, the only child in the home, um, it still would have, uh, I think, had to have happened because his behavior was really um, pretty severe in school and in the neighborhood and, mm -hmm. and in, in other issues. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, today, we're very close with him. He's probably the one of the three boys that we see the most. Mm -hmm. um, he lives the, the closest to us. Um, one of my sons just moved from Wyoming to uh, Nebraska and the other lives in uh, New Zealand, uh, so we don't see them as much. Uh, but we see see this boy quite often, and he's as much of our son as as you are our daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, but we love him just as much. Uh, so we, all that has been worked through, and with the hope of the Holy Spirit and the hope of God, um, it can come out on the other side. Mm -hmm. Amen. Do you have well, any questions? Well, do you have any advice if someone like? on the verge of deciding to offer their home for this reason? Yeah, I, I think in general is is go into it with your eyes wide open. Mm -hmm. Don't expect a normal, um, healthy child. Uh, expect the unexpected. Mm -hmm. And then also be very, very open and willing to accept help from outside yeah. and advice. And um, you're not perfect uh, you, you're you're going to be faced with issues that you normally would not have to be faced with and to kind of expect that and to be okay with it. And it's a beautiful opportunity, I think, for God to work in you as a parent, like mm -hmm. to strip away any selfishness that might be there <laughs> and to make you, we talk on the show a lot about clinging to Christ. Like yes. I can't imagine a situation more where you would need Christ just to get through that day, but how how rewarding at the end of the day when when God makes you um, more like Christ is the ultimate example of a servant. That's right. That's right. It definitely is a calling, but in my opinion, I feel like everyone is called at least to help with foster care in some way or another. Rather that I'm not saying everyone's called to foster or to adopt, but to help those foster families or to help with a social a social worker to help with the room. I don't know if you ever think about the room that these children have to go sit in mm -hmm. while they're waiting on a family to say yes, that they can come to their home. And so even if it's help making that room look a little nicer for mm -hmm. these kids, because a lot of times that room is falling in. Or offering respite care for a family that's or doing all, it every yeah. day to say, you hey, can definitely you do that. Two hours. You just go mm -hmm. read mm -hmm. a book. Let me just yep, you can, them. but you can officially be a respite care provider mm -hmm. where the only, you just get a call for the weekend. You just get a call while these kids get a placement. And so some way or another, I would encourage you 
to get involved somehow. You'll be blessed from it. That's convicting. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for listening to Hannah's Heart. Dad, thank you for sharing your heart. Sure. And I want to say a special shout out to all of my brothers. I'm so glad you're a part of my family. I could not imagine life without you. And you can make me cry. Just I'm thinking. Saying, you're making me tear up. <laughs> and, and I, I would actually echo that too. Um, while it was probably one of the hardest things my wife and I ever did, it was certainly one of the absolute mm-hmm. best. I don't regret it in any way, shape, or form, and I would mm-hmm. do it again in a heartbeat. Love you, big bros.